Dr. Peter Martinez, the Executive Director with Secure World Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Uh, Peter, you're just off the back of the Space Sustainability Summit in New York. We're pleased to be media partners uh, for that event. We're going to talk about uh, space governance uh, in this particular interview, but we might start just with your role. You've worked uh, formerly with the United Nations uh, in space law and, and policy. Uh, yeah, just your, your current role with Secure World Foundation and your focus. Yeah, so I'm the executive director of Secure World Foundation. Uh, I joined the organization in 2018. Um, the Secure World Foundation is the only civil society organization in the world devoted exclusively to the sustainability of space activities. So we focus on preserving outer space as a domain for peaceful use uh, and, and for all nations to continue deriving benefits from the exploration and uses of outer space. And where would be some of the key challenges in this? Uh, is it like herding cats at the moment uh, in terms of getting people alongside or do you find uh, you're making quite uh, strong progress? Yes, there are challenges, but, but we are making progress. So the challenges arise from uh, several factors, uh, what I call the three C's. Uh, firstly, space is becoming uh, increasingly congested with active satellites. In the early days of the space age, uh, really, the, the, the two main uh, actors were the, the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And um, other countries were relatively minor players by comparison. And most, uh, well, practically all space activities were conducted by state or state-owned entities. Nowadays, we have a very different scenario where uh, the majority of satellites in space are actually owned and operated by private sector entities. So space is becoming very congested with active satellites. Um, there are currently, to give you an idea, there are currently about um, uh, 8,000 active satellites uh, in orbit around the Earth, but a much, much larger number of uh, inactive satellites and debris. So this is the second challenge, is the um, contamination that we're seeing of, of the space environment with all this space debris. The active satellites are really just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many more um, uh, debris fragments and inactive satellites that uh, provide no um, service to uh, people on the ground, but that nevertheless pose a collision risk for active satellites and um, crewed spacecraft. The third challenge is that space is becoming increasingly contested, both by um, countries and um, non-state actors alike. And so this is leading to uh, potential for, um, for friction and, uh, and, and for conflict in space. And this is one of the things that we at Secure World try to uh, prevent uh, a situation of uh, conflict arising in outer space. Um, and where do you find, you know, there, there's some forecast there'd be some 50,000 uh, low Earth's orbit uh, satellites by the end of the decade. Uh, is it sort of the Western nations leading this? Uh, and, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, sort of contestation between China and the US where the China's not even responding to, to some of the US uh, Space Command uh, sort of warnings and, and the like in terms of potential collisions. Um, is, it, is it something the United Nations continues to work on and, and progress, or do you find the United States is trying and the Western nations are trying to, to formulate those policies in terms of signatories uh, to their uh, agreements as well? Where, where do you find the, that the key gap uh, currently? Well, at the moment, uh, it is the case that we, I think we're seeing a, a proliferation of space activities around the world, uh, as I mentioned, particularly uh, from private sector entities. And um, we're also seeing different, uh, what you might call the different visions of space uh, exploration and, and space activities. And this isn't surprising. I mean, in, in all of humanity, uh, we diff different countries, different actors have had uh, different visions that they've pursued, whether it's been um, terrestrial exploration or um, in the maritime domain or, or whatever. And it's no surprising that we're seeing these different visions as well. And uh, inevitably, those different visions will intersect, whether they intersect in orbit 
or on the surface of another celestial body. And I think the challenge, the governance challenge to us, uh, and I mean uh, the, the world collectively, is to ensure that where activities being pursued under those different visions intersect, that they do so in an orderly and peaceful manner and that we avoid um, conflict situations. So it's really a challenge. Is it something... Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the militarization uh, of space is doesn't lend itself to governance, so to speak. Uh, do you think that there is a divide there between civil space sector and military? And it's something that, uh, from a governance perspective, you, you tend to talk more to the civil space sector? Well, you see, um, from, uh, from the perspective of, uh, of preserving space as an orderly, stable domain, uh, military and civilian actors have exactly the same interests, right? So... It's like, um, uh, it's like a situation where it wouldn't be in anybody's interests to have different traffic rules for military vehicles and civilian vehicles on our roads, right? And so uh, there are uh, lots of common shared interests in preserving space as a safe and stable operating domain. And uh, let's face it, the, this is also what the private sector um, wants and what investors want. They want space to be a safe, predictable, stable operating domain. And so it really it is in everybody's interests to find cooperative governance solutions to ensure this. And this is what fora like the United Nations are seeking to do. The UN has been um, at the forefront of space governance discussions since the early days of the space age. The international governance framework as, uh, as it exists today was developed in the um, 1960s uh, and, uh, and 1970s and was based on a very different uh, situation as far as the, the conduct of space activities. However, the legal principles that were developed at that time are still just as valid today as they were back then, but the challenge is to apply those principles to the new situations and contexts that we see nowadays. And so we're seeing a, um, a resurgence of, um, of, of discussions uh, in the UN fora around uh, these, um, what, how to apply these treaties that were adopted in the 1960s and 70s to the new situations in outer space today. Um, the, there have been discussions ongoing for the last decade uh, in 2018, the United Nations adopted a set of 21 guidelines for the, interna for the long-term sustainability of space activities. Um, this was a process that uh, I had the, the honor and privilege of, of chairing for eight years. And so I know very well uh, how challenging it was to get consensus uh, of all the countries uh, in this. And I should also uh, take the opportunity to say that Australia played a significant role in helping to build consensus around those guidelines. They are a necessary first step, but only one step in a much longer road to achieving cooperative governance for space activities, which involves not only the UN, but other fora as well, and of course also the private sector, which is accumulating a lot of experience in the safe uh, conduct of space activities and therefore can uh, share this in the development of new standards, protocols, guidelines, etc. Well, I might come to you just to give some thought to what, what role Australia played uh, at the time, because 2018 uh, was pre the Australian Space Agency um, and you were, you were the chair of just already the, the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space or the UN COPOS, uh, as, it, as it was called. Um, yeah, just explain maybe a little bit, given that we're Australia in Space TV, uh, what Australia played there uh, and, and, and at what level. Sure, yeah. So just one minor correction. Uh, I was the chairman of the working group under COPOS that uh, performed this work, not the chair it. of COPOS itself, the but uh, to, to, the, to the Australian role. Um, so under this, under this broad process that we ran at the UN, uh, there were four so-called expert groups that uh, carried out the work. And one of those four expert groups focused on policy and uh, the legal aspects, the regulation of space activities. 
and Australia co-chaired this working group and no, um, uh, who played a significant role in, uh, in formulating those guidelines that deal with the regulation of space activities. Well, I suppose six years on uh, from those guidelines, how what, what would be your feedback? Are those guidelines being implemented? Uh, is there any that sort of stand out to you as, as a key challenge uh, or those that are being readily adopted by most actors? Yeah, so the, the guidelines are being implemented by states. And in fact, um, each year, a number of states voluntarily report their implementation experiences at, at national level. And this is great because the guidelines are very high level instruments. They're not very prescriptive about their manner of implementation. And this was intentional on our part because we recognized that space activities are implemented and regulated in a very different way in different countries. And so we couldn't have a sort of a one size fits all implementation model. So this flexibility uh, also raises um, uh, questions or concerns about the uniformity of implementation because different states uh, implement the guidelines in different ways. And this is why it's so important for states at different, with different levels of space capability to share their national implementation experiences. And countries have been doing this in COPUS. There is a long way to go, but uh, it is very encouraging to see that states are beginning to build their national implementation experience of these guidelines. And I should say that uh, the UN discussions on space sustainability did not end with the adoption of these guidelines. And in fact, the, the UN decided to continue with the second phase of the discussions on space sustainability. Um, those have been ongoing now for the past few years, but indeed, a large part of the focus of those discussions is exactly on the implementation experiences and implementation challenges. What are some of the, the time frames going forward? Is this uh, just a, an ongoing body of work that will continue to be developed uh, or from an audience perspective, where, what would they be looking for uh, in terms of ongoing time frames? Yeah, so th this is an ongoing work. I mean, in terms of developing guidelines or the, the UN processes, uh, there are, of course, fixed time frames for those. But so space sustainability uh, is going to be uh, an ongoing challenge for humanity going forward and um, something that all nations, uh, no matter what their level of capability is, will need to contribute to. Um, because space sustainability is uh, inherently a, uh, an international or multilateral challenge. No single nation uh, or group of like-minded nations or, or no single commercial actor, no matter how capable it is, uh, can ensure the safety and sustainability of uh, the, their space activities through their actions alone. There has to be a collective global response. And so what this requires is uh, leadership and a sense of urgency because we are, uh, in a sense, we don't have the luxury of time. Uh, the space environment is becoming very um, congested, as I said. And so uh, while there are, um, while the technical and uh, uh, regulatory and policy challenges may be significant, in my view, um, an even more significant challenge is that of delivery on the existing rules, guidelines, regulations, etc. Because uh, at the current pace of space activities or the current pace at which space activities are developing, we don't have the luxury of, of a few more decades to address these pressing issues. We need action now. And that means that um, this is a, a matter of leadership. Uh, and we need uh, several forms of leadership. We need thought leadership to, uh, to understand all of the different aspects of space sustainability. We need visionary leadership and new kinds of ways of thinking about how we operate in space. For example, we currently have a largely throwaway culture in space where you know, rockets and satellites have traditionally only been used once. And we need to think about how to move to a circular economy where one person's waste is another person's resource. We also need pace setting leadership to give a sense of urgency to address the space sustainability challenges. Um, and we also need 
leadership informing connections or connective leadership, if you like, to bridge the gaps among people and organizations working on various aspects of this problem. So as you can see, it's a very uh, multifaceted challenge that we're facing. And in fact, in a way, space sustainability, the, 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 our, the, the way that our understanding has evolved, in a sense, parallels the way that our understanding of sustainable development on Earth has evolved. Hmm. Um, if you think about it, you know, back in the, uh, what, what we now think of sustainable, the, the sustainable development goals, the SDGs adopted by the UN in, uh, I think it was 2017, um, that all began back in the 1960s and 70s with the environmental movement, which was inspired in, in a significant part by concerns over pollution, right? And so people began to meet, for example, at the Stockholm conference in 1970 to discuss issues of development and, and, and the planet. Um, and that eventually led to a much deeper understanding of sustainable development as being about much more than just pollution. In a similar way, the concerns or the discussion of space sustainability began around concerns about space debris, the proliferation of space debris. And we now understand that space debris is just symptomatic of a deeper set of issues about how we use space, how we operate in space, how we coexist with each other in space. And so this is why we will be addressing space sustainability challenges for a long time to come. Well, as we, as we say, uh, I've heard the line, uh, as we go to the moon and Mars, uh, sort of same problems, new planet uh, that uh, that we'll have. And uh, that I think that's one of the key dangers. Um, I suppose as a takeaway from the audience, you're uh, sort of leaning on to a summit for the future. Uh, what can the audience uh, sort of expect with that? And uh, obviously the Space Sustainability Summit will continue as well. But yeah, just some of the key events uh, and discussion points that you've got with Secure World Foundation. Right. So, yeah. So you mentioned the Secure World Foundation's um, Summit for Space Sustainability. This is an annual event that we host each year uh, in partnership with um, uh, with a, a host country. We, we move this event around the world. Um, last year, we uh, held it uh, in partnership with um, the UK Space Agency in, in London. This year, it was in, in New York. Uh, again, the UK space agency partnered with us as did the u.s government and really it is to discuss space uh, sustainability in in all of its dimensions as i alluded to a few minutes ago um, we will uh, host a, another um, the summit for space sustainability again in the future this is a, an ongoing series and indeed uh, we would like to host a future summit in in your part of the world nice. somewhere in the in the Asia Pacific region in, in the future. Now you mentioned the um, the summit for the future. This is a uh, an event that is being organized by the United Nations, and it flows from a report that the Secretary General of the UN released two years ago to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the organization, um, and uh, there. Uh, in, in this report, it's called Our Common Agenda, uh, this report uh, reviews some of the, uh, the, lar the, the, the large challenges facing humanity. And in there, space governance is identified as, as one of those challenges that needs a global approach. And so um, there is a suggestion that a summit of the future be held to discuss these global challenges. And one of the, uh, one of the pillars of that a summit would be a discussion of space governance. This is still very much in the early stages. The, the UN is planning this, uh, and it'll be an opportunity for states uh, and, and also for civil society and, and the space industry actors to um, participate in this uh, global high-level summit that will look at the future of space governance and the directions that we need to take in the future. I should also mention another very exciting initiative that was launched just a week ago in London by King Charles III, uh, which is the Astro Carter Initiative. Um, this is an initiative by the king to, um, to build a consensus around the, um, the, the governance 
uh, of space and the ways that we utilize the space uh, environment to keep it a domain for uh, peaceful and useful use and exploration and um, a sustainable domain uh, for future generations. And so this is another exciting new development that uh, we will follow with interest. Wonderful. Well, look, we'll definitely uh, uh, stay in touch with Secure World Foundation and the work that you're doing. Uh, as you say, this is an ongoing uh, body of work uh, and with some fundamental challenges uh, for the world and, as you say, humanity as well. So, Peter Martinez, thank you very much for joining us today on Australia in Space TV. Uh, we do have some, we will have some links in the show notes uh, to your websites and also some of the coverage that we had from last week's Space Sustainability Summit uh, in New York. So wonderful to uh, to have you with us today uh, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on your show.